I'm here to cheer you up. You are terrible at studying. And I am terrible at studying. <laughs> In fact, we all human beings are incredibly slow at acquiring new declarative knowledge. And there's a good reason. We did not evolve for studying. Our brain next to a computer looks like Mr. Bean's car next to the space shuttle. <sighs> now, we did not evolve for studying because acquiring declarative knowledge was not an evolutionary priority. Back when we were cavemen, our brain was tasked to doing something like remembering where our cave was, looking for next meal, hopefully not becoming one, not remembering iambic pentameters. And so the big question now is, if studying is not an evolutionary priority, how can we exploit those brain structures and functions which were an evolutionary priority to actually give our memory superpowers. My name is Giulio De Angeli, I'm a neuroscientist and a devoted lifelong learner. I spent the last 20 years studying and at the same time being the object of my study. I've tried quite literally, literally everything you could think of, every method, every possible technique. You don't believe me? Once I even was crazy enough to have myself tied to a chair all night to study. By the way, don't, don't try it, that method, it's terrible. <laughs> doesn't work. <laughs> Anyhow, the, this talk will be a condensation of 20 years of experience and scientific literature into seven tips, the seven most important, important rules to actually become efficient in memorizing. So, piece of material number one, always give structure to information. For example, you should never attempt to learn a long list as it is. You should always restructure it. Why is that? Well, because of how memory works. Basically, in order for a concept to be memorized, it must first go through what is known as working memory, basically short-term memory, and after that, can it be actually converted to long-term memory. And here's uh, an important step. Working memory in human being has a capacity which is extraordinarily conserved from individual to individual. In fact, we all human beings can keep in our mind, short term, at once, only seven pieces of information. Seven plus minus two. Seven is the magical number. Now, despite this rule of nature, we can still increase the capacity of our working memory. How? Not by increasing the number of items, that's utterly impossible, but rather by increasing the complexity of each item. For, exa for example, it's absolutely impossible to remember 14 digits as they are, but it is definitely feasible to remember seven pairs of digits. This technique has a name, it's called chunking. It's very, very important. I used to do this a lot. So whenever I encountered long lists, more than seven, I used to restructure them, basically to, um, so as to make sure that the total number of items is seven at worst. And to be honest, uh, I used to find this problem of long lists mostly in one subject. I won't tell you which one it is. <coughs> it's in... <coughs> Now, <laughs> piece of material number two, always highlight and underline. It's pretty much equivalent according to literature. And um, importantly, now, um, while you're doing this, while you're highlighting, you should always try to, again, give structure to the material. For example, uh, when I did my highlighting, I used to have this lovely cup of markers, and I used to highlight different pieces of homogeneous material in different colors and to write a little text next to it, a little title, so as to restructure basically the, the text. And importantly, while you highlight lighting, never pay attention to those people that tell you you should highlight at best 10, 20, 30 percent of the material. It's never a matter of how much you are lighting, it's all a matter of what you are lighting. And here I have my own personal oath, which is very simple. I will highlight all and only the information that I deem worthy of being revised at least once. That's it. I don't care if it's uh, 10 percent or 90 percent of the book. Don't care. But I'm consistent with this rule. I do not highlight everything that I can virtually reconstruct from what I already highlighted. Uh, for example, obvious examples or, or, any, um, or, or anything that I already know. Basically, anything that I don't need to see again. Now, 
piece number three is never reread, always rehearse. Now, here there's a problem. <laughs> uh, we are so slow at acquiring knowledge, not only because our brain looks like Mr. Bean's car, <laughs> but because we also drive it like Mr. Bean. <laughs> And in fact, if I asked you, what's the most widely adopted study method of all in the general population? Well, it turns out it's rereading the material repeatedly. There's a small problem. <laughs> the literature evidence says that it's virtually the most awful method of all. It's the most inefficient. And these have this, this concept has deep roots in how memory works. Because, you know, many people think that memory is some sort of copy-paste. You just need to expose yourself. The more you expose yourself to the material, the better it will be copied. Which is kind of true. It's only half of the story. Because the other half is that further to exposing ourselves and copying information into our brain, we must also learn how to get it out. This is called retrieval in technical terms. Now, you must exercise retrieval. And in fact, while you are exercising retrieval, you are also building logical connections from the context, from your memory database, what you already know, to the new item. These new connections will serve as access points to actually get the information at will when you need it. When you need it. Now, um, this is not a mere metaphor. This goes down to literal electric connections that actually link our brain circuitries, which represent different concepts in our brain. And so you, it's very important. Uh, exercising retrieval is not, uh, is not less important for one bit than actually exposing yourself to the information. Then how should you do that? Well, the simplest way is just to rehearse aloud to repeat material aloud. It's an extremely useful exercise, but you should not do this literally. You should do this in a more creative, as creatively as you can. You should interrogate yourself, self-interrogation. This is extremely crucial. And uh, you should grill yourself with complex questions because the objective is to build long-range connections between topics, but even better, between different subjects also. Now, of course, I used to do this a lot, there's a small problem. <laughs> Where should you go rehearse? <laughs> when I was a student in Pisa, in the summer it used to be very hot. And here I have a personal confession to make. I, my favorite place to go rehearse in Pisa was this lovely park along the Arno River. You see that concrete embankment. I used to walk up and down that concrete embankment all day, rehearsing aloud. It was the student's paradise. It had absolutely everything you could desire as a student. It had terrific air quality, oxygen, by the way. It had, it had also exercise. It was a paradise. Uh, there was a catch. Uh, other people. Uh, turns out, apparently, that when you speak aloud, uh, other people can hear you. And, <laughs> and if you're speaking about mathematics, Betsy, and electronics, yeah, still, they can hear you. Uh, and here I have my personal brilliant solution, which is to do this anyway, not <laughs> caring. <laughs> and I encourage you to do the same. <laughs> Next piece of material, number four, create your own materials. Do this effort. Uh, here, there's a very important principle in neuroscience, neuroscience, which is called generation effect. Basically, whenever you utilize information to build something, to make something, you will fix it in your memory much better than when you just expose yourself to information, for example, when you read. Generation effect is very important. Now, so it's important to know that when the time you're spending making materials is not what you do before memorization. It's actually memorization time of the finest quality. There's all sorts of material you could create. Uh, for example, you could make your own notes, your own little textbooks. Uh, notes all over the window, notes all over the walls, <laughs> you see the gist, <laughs> all over your closet, of course. Now, I have another suggestion here. While you are making these notes, never summarize. And here, this goes against much, actually, also much scientific literature, but it's my personal advice. Because when you're studying, for example, for an exam, when you summarize or when you make concept maps, you are highlighting the broadest concepts, but those were the easiest to remember in the first place. What is much more difficult to remember are all the little, tiny little details. You see, 
So what you should do, in my opinion, what I used to do is to summarize, but in a lossless way, you know, like in computers, lossless compression, do say exactly the same amount of information, not, not one bit less, but using, using less words. So I encourage you to practice this technique. Next piece of material is to test yourself. Like we've just seen generation effect, there's another very important um, psychological principle, which is a testing effect. Whenever you grill yourself, you challenge yourself to remember something, these items will be remembered very, very efficiently by your brain. And again, there are so many techniques you could apply. Uh, for example, I have, I'm here proposing one to you, which I designed and I used extensively during my studies, which is very simple. You basically take, um, take the material, you do a lossless compression, by now you know what it is, and you basically summarize in a lossless way all the material in the right column of a text. Then you apply whiteout, you know, gaps, gaps to the most difficult words, and you write down the solution of each gap in the same line. You must pay attention that the solution of each gap is in the same line as the gap. Then you print it out. You could do this on a, on a spreadsheet, it's very easy. And you take a nice little piece of cardboard and you start rehearsing aloud, sliding it down. This way, whenever you encounter a gap, you must force yourself to remember what went in that particular gap. And you do retrieval practice, which you now know is extremely important. Piece of advice number six. You should take learning to the next level, which is gamify it. Again, evidence says that whenever you play with your studies, you will remember items much more efficiently. Again, there are many techniques you could apply. One that I particularly feel comfortable with is flashcards, but not the traditional flashcards, you know, with one specific question and uh, like a three word answer. No, nothing of the sort. I used to compress entire books into flashcard formats. You see here some examples. So you remember how I told you I highlight different pieces of material in different colors with a little title? Well, every little paragraph goes into a flashcard and the title becomes the question of the flashcard. Then you start rehearsing. Basically, you look at the title, you try to remember everything you knew about that particular subject, the particular topic, and then you check if you said absolutely everything. If this is the case, the card is discarded. Otherwise, it goes back to the bottom of the, of the deck. And flashcards are an extremely handy technique for multiple reasons. Uh, for example, you see, the beauty is that they are pocket size, so whenever, wherever you are, you may be at your dentist, you may be on a bus, you may be queuing for any reason, you pick them up and start rehearsing. <laughs> and this is true even if you are on a long train journey and the only cardboard you have is a box of biscuits. Don't ask how I know. No. <laughs> Piece of material number seven, final one. You know, it's a heptalogue after all. You should use mnemonics, but use them wisely, with a grain of salt. Why? Well, you know by now that memory is all about connections. That's the format of our files in our brain. But it's also true that there are some kinds of information where it's absolutely impossible to build logical connections. For example, the numbers of laws, those do not have any, have any actual reason for being so. Or, for example, uh, the, um, the eponyms, you know, names of theorems, names of laws, whatever. Those are historical. So, what, you, what should you do? Well, it's here that you enter the magical realm of mnemonics. Mnemonics are a strategy to build up connections that are entirely artificial. They are made up, completely untrue, right? There are many techniques that you can apply. Google them, look them up online, there's plenty. For example, for uh, numbers, there's the major system. For long list, there's Cicero's Locke method. Um, then there's visualization for concepts, there are many. But what I want to emphasize here is that mnemonics are not the key for being a great student or a great memorizer. Well, they are indeed the key to memorize large amounts of information that do not have any practical use. For example, if I asked you, you know pi, 3.1415, etc., the, the, the decimal digits of pi. Well, 
if I ask you, what's the world record of remembering pi digits? Well, it turns out it's 70,030, <laughs> right? Okay, this is entirely made possible by mnemonics. But studying is something different. Studying is about making connections. And truthful connections, the ones that you make when you grill yourself with self-interrogation, are always much better than the artificial connections that you make up inventing them using mnemonics. And here I should stop. I hope that by now you appreciate the utter difference that there is between our brain and computers. Because you see, computers can be extremely powerful, but eventually the result of their computation will always be something inherently stupid, a string of zeros and one, which needs humans to be interpreted. While for humans, the final result of our computation is connections. Connections between our brain circuits in the same structure that performs elaboration. We don't have a hard disk and a CPU because in our brain the cortex is both of them. It's both the warehouse of information, the hard disk, as well as the CPU, the processor. I apologize if this talk was particularly demanding for you to follow. But if I rescued any one of you from having themselves tied to a chair all night, I say it was all worthy. Thank you.